Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have the privilege of announcing this year's winner of the International Conference on Climate Change Award for Excellence in Climate Science Communication. And that's what this is here. Uh, the purpose of the award is to recognize someone who's made an outstanding contribution to public understanding of what science really says about climate change, okay? Not what's politically correct, but what is really stated. This year's award winner is Anthony Watts, as you know right here. Well, I guess that uh, response certainly speaks volumes, more than I could say. <laughs> But anyway, he's the author and the creator and the, the operator of What's Up With That, okay? What's, W-A-T-T-S, up with that. It's interesting that it's been operating 24 hours a day since November 2006 and is now approaching 250 million views, a quarter of a billion views, okay? So someone like Fred Pierce was not exaggerating when he said that this is the world's most viewed climate website. Okay, this is pretty incredible, and, and everybody goes there. Many people in the audience are telling me how they check his site more than once a day. Okay, so there's very, very important information there constantly. In fact, even Wikipedia, believe it or not, <laughs> admits that between 2008 and 2013, What's Up With That won internet voting-based awards for the best science blog and the best blog from both the bloggies and Whizbang uh, web blog awards. Tim Ball was telling me the other day that um, What's Up With That made a crucially important contribution to the public debate about climate change because it allowed both sides of the debate, without censorship, to present their point of view. Okay? So from that point of view, Anthony's blog has been really a godsend. It's, it's something that you know, really made a very big difference to the whole debate. Not just in America, by the way, because up here in Canada, and Canada has announced we're following America on climate policy anyways, so it turns out that our climate policy is being decided in Washington, which is one of the reasons that I write a lot in the United States, by the way. But all over the world, his site is really revered. Um, those of you who uh, have been following Anthony's activities will be happy to hear that he's starting a new organization that he's announcing in the uh, acceptance speech, which we're just about to hear. Now, Anthony has a somewhat of a quirky sense of humor. I asked him for something funny about his background, and he sent me the following story. In December 2012, I sent Dr. Michael Mann a free calendar as a Christmas gift. <laughs> <laughs> illustrated, illustrated by our volunteer cartoonist, Josh. I also sent one to Dr. Gavin Schmidt, Dana Nuccicelli, and Dr. Peter Glick. Upon hearing that his cohorts got one, Dr. Mann immediately went into full Kosh Brothers conspiracy mode on Twitter, wondering where I got the money to produce such a slick-looking, flashy... <laughs> where did he get the money to produce such a slick-looking, flashy, apparently widely distributed calendar? Well, the truth was far simpler. I simply used my credit card to pay $15.84 and had the calendar printed at Costco Photo Center <laughs> and then drop shipped yeah. to him. <laughs> like Hillary Clinton, who apparently has not driven a car since 1996, Dr. Mann has apparently never been to Costco. <laughs> so his sense of humor, uh, a little like Monty Python maybe. <laughs> Of course, Anthony's main professional background and experience is in weather measurement and weather presentation technology. For example, his company Intel Weather produces exceptional weather graphics, and you see that often on the web. He spent 25 years on air as a television meteorologist with a number of television stations in Indiana, California, and is now the chief meteorologist with KPay AM Radio in Chico, California. While Anthony will be long remembered for his fine work telling the public about what climate science really says about climate and weather, uh, perhaps future generations will honor him the most for one particular project, and that is his Weather Stations project launched in 2007, and that is worth an applause. <laughs> In 
In that project, he and hundreds of volunteers photographed weather stations from across the U.S. to try to see how well were they sighted. Were they actually following the sighting requirements uh, that, that the various organizations, NOAA in particular, had specified for their own weather stations? And after looking at, in 2009, after looking at about 70% of the 1,221 stations, they found that most of them were below acceptable standards. Many of you will have seen Heartland's excellent report on this, and I'll just hold it up. It's on the web as well. It's called, Is the U.S. Surface Temperature Record Reliable? Okay, so Anthony wrote this, and it summarizes his work in, as I say, what I think future generations will thank him from taking the lid off the Pandora's box to see what's really going on at these weather stations. Now, we know that NOAA considered this very important because they did their absolute best, of course, to discredit it. And so, you know, that, the harder you're attacked. You know, I have a friend who's a, a World War II Lancaster bomber pilot. He's 95 years old. And he, he told me this the other day when I was kind of moping about all the attacks on the Internet. You know, oh, my God, I'm a climate science denier and all this. And Anthony, I'm sure, gets a lot more than I do. He said, well, you know, if we went on a trip bombing in Europe, if we came back and we didn't have a lot of holes in our airplane, if we weren't attacked, then we knew we were dropping our bombs in the wrong place. <laughs> so, so he said that a measure of your success is the amount you're attacked. Okay? And, uh, but you know, even Wikipedia, as I say, they were quite complimentary. I went to Wikipedia to learn more about you. And, and it was, you know, they, they had to sort of put in a little caveat. Oh, but what he's saying is not true, you know. But then they'd have to admit that you got these awards for what's up with that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the winner of this year's Excellence in Communications Award, Anthony Watts. Well, thank you and good morning, everyone. You know, uh, Dr. Roy Spencer once told me that getting skeptics together on an issue is like herding cats. Well, here you all are. <laughs> and it's a measure of the success of the Heartland Institute that they are able to make these events continually happen and to have them sold out this year. Let's give them a big hand for all their efforts. Well, uh, it's been a long journey for me. There's been lots of trials and tribulations along the way, as Tom pointed out, the measure of success, the number of attacks I've been getting. And, of course, I've been getting a lot, but I've also gotten some accolades. But let me tell you, it's never been uninteresting. And uh, it, there's not a day goes by where something new, unique, and fun doesn't occur. Uh, like this morning, for example, I learned that uh, Mark Stein is going to uh, be printing a new book. Uh, and, well, you just have to go to the website at WhatsApp with that to see it. But I got to tell you, he's going to be setting the cat amongst the pigeons with this one. <laughs> so I'd like to thank a few people first. First of all, I'd like to thank Joe Bast of the Heartland Institute, who could not be here today. He's dealing with um, shingles, and he may be watching on video. Joe, a sincere thank you. And of course, his staff, Jim Lakely, and everyone else who's put this together, Nikki Comerford, they've all done a fantastic job, and I want to thank them personally. <laughs> Other people I'd like to thank include Stephen McIntyre, who's not here today, but he set the model for how to conduct science and how to conduct public communications in the form of a blog. He's been the model not just for me, but for many other people, and I think he should be the one up here instead of me. I'd like to thank Mark Moreno for all of his, uh, there he is back there, for all of his work in helping to get the word out to the media and for standing up tall and all of that. Um, I'd like to thank some of the people that have helped me personally, and that includes Charles Rotter, who is known as uh, Charles the Moderator on my blog. He's been instrumental in helping keep things on the straight and narrow. And I'd like to thank Stephen Mosher, who 
literally irritates the crap out of me sometimes. <laughs> but he also keeps me on the straight and narrow. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Dave Steely and all of the moderators that help keep the site running throughout the day. They do a tremendous job of keeping things as civil as they can, although it's sometimes very difficult. Uh, as you know, the, the uh, debate is quite contentious. And I'd like to thank Josh, our resident volunteer cartoonist, who without his skills, we would never have had a free Christmas gift for Dr. Michael Mann. <laughs> And finally, I'd like to thank Professor Marisa Mark of Weber International University, who's been helping with editing my new paper. She's been instrumental in uh, making that what it's going to be, and also getting me through and making me understand some of the things that are going on in some of the darkest times. Now I'd like to tell you about something I started about a year ago, and has finally come to fruition. You all have on your chairs a piece of paper that says the Open Atmospheric Society. Now, about a year ago, I started this organization uh, with the idea of having a scientific organization that would be different from any other. One of the problems that we have in climate science is that peer review sometimes becomes power review. The, the climate science is almost cliquish in its smallness, and so Getting papers published is sometimes a very difficult task, getting past that uh, gatekeeping gauntlet. And so uh, I set out, with the help of some others, to put together an organization that would offer an alternative for publication, uh, not just from a society standpoint, but also from a journal standpoint. And what we're going to do with the journal is something that no other journal does or has done. And that is, for papers that we will consider for publication, they have to submit replication, data, and code up front, or we won't even look at it. And so, for all of you that have that piece of paper in front of you, uh, I'd like to tell you that after a year, we had to go a little bit dormant for a while because we were applying for tax-exempt status, to something that's granted to thousands of NGOs, you know, here in Washington and elsewhere. Lots of societies get this, but you know, it's always a bit more difficult for skeptics to get anything done, and it usually takes twice or three times as long to accomplish such tasks, because people throw roadblocks in the way. Well, we now have 501c3 status, and we are going to move forward. And I'd like to ask all of you who have that paper in front of you to consider joining the society, and when we make a call for papers, to consider submitting a scientific paper, and make sure that you submit all your data and your code, and make sure it's replicable when you do. So you can visit it at the OAS for Open Atmospheric Society, theoas.org. Anyway, as I said, it's been a long journey for me. Uh, there's been lots of highs, lots of lows, and lots of blogging in all the middle. And I want to thank everyone who's helped me on this journey and getting here today. I'm very humbled by this award and by the accolades presented to me. And I'll just simply end by saying thank you very much. Thank you.